Danke. When we talk about bigotry, we're talking about something really serious. Because this year, we actually have manifestos. On August 3rd of this year, when a 21-year-old went into a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, and killed 22 innocent people, he had a manifesto. When Brendan Trant went and opened fire on Muslim worshipers in Christ Church in New Zealand, killing 51 worshipers, he had a manifesto. They are members of a large, ideological, militant network that is dedicated to spreading hate and racism against immigrant communities, especially Muslims perceived of as invaders. In both of their manifestos, and many white terrorist manifestos, connect to a deep cultural understanding that, that something sinister is happening. They're part of a larger phenomenon, an amalgamation of various ultra-nationalist government movements, political movements, and groups all around the world united by hate for immigrants, refugees, Muslims, and increasingly Jews in this country and all over the world. This comes from the Great Replacement Theory, framed after a similarly named conspiracy theory. And the writer of this is a French writer, the La, La Grand Replacement, and even more extreme interpretations are starting to rise. We used to talk about the clash of civilizations being the way with which we would redefine foreign policy and engagement. It's this new grand replacement strategy that we need to understand. It, along with such other literature, is very widely popular amongst the far right, representing a new ideological frame. Until recently, it seemed to be disorganized and fragmented. But today, it's tied to a very specific mantra of protecting from the Muslim invasion. The common thread between violent white nationalist males who commit mass murders is obvious, like the two I cited earlier. They've left their own manifestos, and according to CNN, they're filled with white nationalist and racist hatred towards immigrants, Hispanics, blaming immigrants and first-generation Americans for taking away jobs and blending the cultures of the United States. Moreover, both seem to subscribe to an intellectual discourse that they found posted in a 16,000 word document on Twitter and on 8chan that's filled with anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim sentiment. One of the professors I follow, Catherine Bellow at the University of Chicago, talks about where this anger comes from. Yes, it's a post-Vietnam moment, but where the radical Klansmen and the radical tax pro protect protesters and skinheads all come together. But the replacement theory and all their unwritten manifestos and written ones are actually this larger trope, a larger trope that aims to actually target certain communities as the foil for every problem that people have. In my last lecture today, I talked about um, the study out of Princeton University that follows the largest group, that the largest suicide rate among which group? The largest group's suicide rate is among uneducated white males who feel like the country's leaving them. And so here you have a narrative that says everything to blame for are these immigrant groups, are these Muslim groups, are these Jewish groups. And this is not just limited to the far right nationalists. Kellyanne Conway, who speaks for the president, says very often on the news, where are all the missing white voters? This is a very anti-immigration platform, but this is about the erasure, the great replacement theory, and how it's permeating our national culture. The fiction that there is voter registration of millions and thousands that are fake. I often wondered what do they hate more? Judge Jeanine Pirro on Fox News says every, every night. Do they hate Donald Trump, or do they hate the people that put him in office? The idea that these groups are Muslims, immigrants, Mexicans, Jews, are full of hate against white people. Well, they hate Donald Trump, she says. He's the one they want to get rid of because people like you and me who put him into office, their plan, their plot is to remake America. In the coming election year, according to the FBI, Next year might be the most violent year for immigrants, Muslims, and Jews in the United States. And they say that for the past three years, 19, uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, anti-violence against Muslims 
and Jews and immigrants has gone up 17% every single year. That right now we are in the most violent time for immigrants, Muslims and Jews in this country. And they warn that next year might be the most violent. And the reason why, it's an election year. So one of the projects that I worked on that was published last, um, last year by the Atlantic Council actually follows the increase of anti-Muslim sentiment in the run-up to an election. And we think it's a Trump phenomenon, but it actually started with the election of President Obama, the audacity of a black man to run for office and win. And so, and I'm gonna get to this because I want you to really understand what it meant for a black man to win. And so in my study, what you find is that it was the anti-Obama tied to racism coupled with anti-Muslim sentiment, the constant recognition that Hussein Obama can't be trusted. And this comes at a criti critical moment because we think it's the first time it's happened in US history of what about them, what about the immigrants, what about the Muslims? It wasn't. If we go back for a second, let me be a professor for three minutes. If you go back into our history, the ratification of the Constitution in, 1970, in 1776, it was this great debate among the Federalists and Anti-Federalists about the future of this country. And the debate was about Article 2, should there be a religious litmus test that only a Protestant could be president? And William Lancaster, a delegate from North Carolina, warns, and I said, and I quote, he says, I don't know how it will work. We are envisioning a country, he, he's the, we're about to ratify the Constitution. We are envisioning a country in four or 500 years from now, I don't know how it will work. A papist might occupy that chair, a Mohammedan might take it. The chair is the seat of the presidency of the United States. Mohammedans is what they used to refer to Muslims. And so here embroiled in the Constitution, the ratification of the Constitution of the United States in 1976, 1776 is a question of what about the Muslims? And so inherent in the idea, the formation of the modern day identity of this country is what about the Muslims? But the beauty of this debate is that it forces the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists to engage in a conversation about the future identity of the United States and the idea that there would not be a religious litmus test. And it forces them to defend at that time the possibility of a future Muslim president. And so let's go back to President Obama the audacity of black man to run for office and win. That was the kind of critical marking of the country's changing, the Hispanic vote. And this is where the grand narrative of replacement theory entered into our political discourse. We used to talk about things in the marginal, it became mainstream at that moment, 2008. After 2008, we had 2010. 2010, those of us are from, from New York know what happened the summer of 2010. It was the run-up to the midterm election, the hysteria around the Ground Zero Mosque. It's not a mosque. It's not a Ground Zero. There actually is a masjid close to Ground Zero. But the hysteria that summer around the Ground Zero Mosque allowed for a wave, a new wave, of right-wing Republicans called the Tea Party to enter into the political established mainstream at the expense of Muslims in the United States. Because what had just happened two years earlier? President Obama had the audacity to win. And so you see embroiled now in politics is not just identity politics, but the most publicly and socially acceptable form of bigotry is anti-Muslim bigotry. And so you could write it into office like what happened in 2010. 2012, the next presidential election, we saw a rise in the anti-Sharia movement. The anti-Sharia movement and legislation to be passed in over two dozen states, it was never about getting the legislation passed. We knew it wouldn't pass. It was about creating hysteria around Islam and Muslims to be feared that if we don't win, if the Tea Party doesn't continue to win, these people will take over. It comes into finally 2015 Republican primary, 2016 the election of President Trump, where in my study, the violent rhetoric not just goes from the Tea Party, but mainstream political establishments from within the Republican Party, where people running for office were saying, Muslims can't be trusted. Muslims can't carry cabinet positions. That Muslims are the one population you need to be fearful for, leading us into the first um, decree by the president, the executive order of the first Muslim man. And so here we saw the definition of what it means to be American in terms of identity politics historically was grounded in who are we as opposed to them, the creation of the other, the Muslim other. Today, it is continuing, but in a much more violent term. 
And it brings me to this kind of critical conclusion. You're giving me a sign? Yeah. Three minutes? I'll skip way ahead. No, no, Imam Suraj, no one can take your time. Are you kidding? <laughs> the critical question here is that when we talk about Islamophobia as the most publicly acceptable form of anti-Muslim bigotry or anti-anything bigotry, it would not work if it wasn't based on endemic racism in the United States. And we have to acknowledge that our struggle as a Muslim community is fundamentally tied to the anti-black racism in this country. And that ours is built on theirs. And that they carry the burden of ours on top of theirs in many different ways, right? Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. We're a privileged community. We are sitting here in a beautiful convention center talking about the ills of our problems. That's privilege. Our situation is built on a struggle that it's much longer and much more dangerous and much more vile. I remember um, teaching uh, you know, during the, um, the election of President Trump. And when President Trump was elected, let me just be honest, I was in the Hillary Clinton victory party. And so I remember walking the streets afterward, the zombie apocalypse, like what had happened to us. And the next day going to university and students coming to me with like the, the PTSD of what just happened. And I, I have one African-American grad student who's looking around. Like, Are you guys kidding me? Welcome to every day of my existence. Where have you been? If our struggle is not fundamentally acknowledging the struggles of those before us and those that continue to struggle exponentially more than us, then we are fighting for justice just for us. And we'll never get it. The problem with the way we talk about Islamophobia is that we as Muslims have accepted that we are going to define ourselves against Islamophobia. Islamophobia is defined by care as the irrational fear of Islam and Muslims. But the amazing thing that care does is extends the definition that there's a political objective of Islamophobia and the Islamophobia industry, and that's to marginalize Muslims from civic and political life. That there is an objective that we internalize Islamophobia and we say, I fundamentally don't belong, so I don't become politically and socially and civically engaged. The problem is if we don't become politically and socially and civically engaged, not only do we accept the nar Islamophobic narrative on who we are, we deny everyone else their social justice struggles that they've been fighting for for so long. Time's up. In conclusion, <laughs> I have five pages left, in conclusion. SubhanAllah, when we talk about where our izza comes from, what does it mean to be Muslim? Alhamdulillah, that we are privileged, that we are happy, that we are honored, that we are Muslims. And we are honored with this. It's not in the sense of honor and rights that comes from the Western liberal intellectual construct. It comes from one deep thing, and that is of duty and obligation. That duty and obligation that comes from the privilege of being Muslim means that we have to be active participants in social justice change, that we have active participants in creating a just society, that we are active participants in saying that this can't exist in our name. And brothers and sisters, if we don't stop talking about anti-Muslim center and Islamophobia as just targeting our community, but part of a bigger paradigm of increasing bigotry, built on the bigotry that established this country in many other ways, then we're missing the bigger picture. If we're going to actually combat bigotry in the United States, bigotry in the coming election, anticipating the violence, if we don't see our story as built on the stories of others, then we're actually doing our community injustice. Thank you.